when you set up a fab repro cavity, we have curved mirrors, and the curvature of those mirrors defines an eigenmode, a particular shape for the Gaussian beam that can resonate inside that cavity. If this is a symmetric cavity, such that both mirrors are identical, we would expect the waist of that cavity to be in the center, and we could work out the eigenmode by finding what the radius of curvature of a wavefront is for a given size waist, and constraining that to equal the radius of curvature of the mirrors, then solving for the waist. Now, the laser that we use to illuminate this has its own Gaussian beam profile. And the profile coming out of that laser most likely does not match the particular Gaussian beam profile we need inside the cavity for a stable mode. So there's different things you can do. One is you can just blast all of that light into the cavity and allow the cavity to select uh, the portion of this light that matches to this mode. And if you do, you'll get a significantly smaller amount of power resonating in the cavity than is available from the entire laser. So assuming that we don't want to be uh, wasting power like that, we can put in some lens or system of lenses to try to better match the shape of the light going into the cavity to that's expected on the inside. And it may not be possible to do with a single lens, although sometimes we can get close. Uh, with a pair of lenses, you have much more degree of freedom because you can also control the spacing between the lenses as well as their focal length to design an optical system where the Gaussian beam profile of the light going into the laser, or going into the cavity, very closely matches the eigenmode of the cavity. That process is called a mode matching. It's a necessary step in order to efficiently couple a laser into a cavity. And it's one that uh, I found there aren't a lot of tutorials available, so hopefully this will be useful. Now, we can tell when we have our cavity mode matched, or we can tell how much uh, deviation we have from ideal mode matching if we put a photo detector at the output of our cavity, we detect the light that leaks out, and then we drive one of the mirrors back and forth. Presumably we have a piezoelectric transducer on a mirror. We could also drive the laser frequency if that's an option. So in this configuration, this is called a uh, scanning fabric pro cavity. scanning because we're going to scan the length of the mirror. And so typically what we would do is put in a sawtooth waveform to the mirror, and then we would plot on an oscilloscope the uh, waveform versus the detected power. So the detected power will be on the y-axis, uh, the voltage we're applying will be on the x-axis. And if it's a sawtooth waveform, uh, that voltage is varying linearly with time, so we can often neglect uh, this and just plot versus time and instead use this to trigger the oscilloscope so that we're always starting at the same point on the waveform. And if we do that, what we'd expect to see is peaks in a repetitive pattern where the spacing of those peaks corresponds to the free spectral range of my cavity. If we're scanning the mirror, this represents uh, the time over which the mirror has moved by a half a wavelength. So we increase the number of uh, wavelengths in this resonant cavity by one between successive peaks. Now, if the cavity is well aligned, we should see a dominant peak that is uh, going to be the TEM00 mode. These other peaks are what we call higher order modes. Okay, and this is assuming we have a single frequency laser. 
then these higher order modes are going to be due to some misalignment of the cavity to the input beam. Okay, so that is to say that the input beam is not mode matched to the cavity. It's not exciting just a single resonant mode, it's actually exciting uh, multiple resonant modes, each with a slightly different phase shift on a round trip in the cavity and therefore appearing at slightly different points in this output spectrum. As we adjust the tip and tilt of these mirrors for the position of these lenses, we change the mode overlap between the input beam and the resonant beam, and we shift the relative amount of power in these peaks. A well mode matched beam is one where virtually all the power is in these single large peaks. The more power is in these uh, smaller peaks, the worse the mode matching. So you can use this as a way to identify when you've achieved proper mode matching for the cavity. You can also look at the light here. You could either put in a beam splitter and a camera, or you may be able to stick a piece of paper in and observe visually, if you're using visible light, to look at the power that comes out as you scan. And each of these large peaks should be uh, a zero, zero mode. That is to say, you should see an intensity profile that looks circular. Whereas the higher order modes, uh, when those are resonant, you should see some higher order mode distribution, uh, like a 1, 0 mode, or maybe a 1, 1 mode, something like this. And if you see significant power in higher order modes where there is a large number of lobes, that suggests there's a large amount of mismatch. If those lobes are horizontal, it typically suggests that you need to change the horizontal alignment of the cavity mirrors uh, relative to the input beam. If you see a mode pattern that has a large number of lobes in a vertical direction, that would suggest you need a vertical adjustment to the alignment. And if you see what we call donut modes, something like this, that suggests there's a radius of curvature mismatch and that the lenses need to be moved or reconfigured. Okay, so this is all well and good, but how do you go about actually finding uh, the particular focal lengths that will give you the desired mode matching condition? In order to do that, you really need to understand how Gaussian beams propagate, and for that we need to use the Gaussian Q parameter. I'll describe a little bit of the background in that, but mostly I'll show you a shortcut we can use uh, to get very quick results for uh, choices of lenses that will get us close to the desired mode matching condition. So just to recall that uh, Gaussian beams transform when they go through an optic according to a particular relation that uses the ABCD matrix matrices for the, that optic, uh, the same ones that are used in ray matrices. If this is not familiar to you, you should find a uh, introductory textbook on optics and look up ray matrices. The ones that are particularly relevant for us are a free space of a distance L, and for that, the Gaussian beam before the propagating a distance L is related to the, the beam after, uh, or at least its Q parameter is related by the old Q parameter plus L gives us the new parameter. And the other relationship that's important is what happens when a Gaussian beam goes through a lens. So if our old parameter is Q, and our new parameter on the other side of the lens is Q prime. Those parameters are related by the equation on the bottom, one over Q minus one over F, the focal length of the lens, equals one over Q prime, the new Gaussian beam parameter. So with those two relationships, we can calculate how a Gaussian beam propagates through a system of free space and lenses. So let's start with a collimated beam illuminating a lens and let's find where it has a new waist and what that new waist size is. So our input beam will say is collimated, has a Gaussian beam radius of W1. So before the lens we have a Q parameter Q1 that's defined uh, using the reciprocal definition uh, that we have for Gaussian beam parameters. And at a waist 
the radius of curvature is infinite and the cube parameter is purely imaginary and depends only on the size of the waist and the wavelength. Okay, so that definition is shown on the top left. Propagating through the lens, parameter Q1 transforms to Q2 using the relationship shown in the top middle. And then after the lens, going from position 2 to position 3, a distance of z, the Gaussian beam Q parameter transforms as shown, Q3 equals 2Q plus z. That's shown in the top right. So we can start with Q1, plug it into the uh, expression for Q2, get an expression for Q2, plug that into the expression for Q3, and that's what's written on the bottom equation. Now we want Q3, we want position 3 to be a waste, and that means the Q parameter should be purely imaginary. Because you remember the real part is related to the radius of curvature, the radius of curvature is infinite, um, and that gives us a purely imaginary Q parameter. So take the term in the top left of this expression, the top left meaning the numerator, first term in the numerator, set it equal to zero and solve for z, and that tells us where we have to propagate the beam to to get to a waste. Okay, so that expression is given here in the middle. And once we know where the waste is, we can plug that value for z in to the q parameter, get an expression for the q parameter, uh, which we can then solve for w3, the size of the waist, and that's given here on the bottom. So now we've calculated the position and the size of the waist. We can use an assumption that the uh, new focal spot is within the near field of the old focal spot, and what that means is the uh, expression in the denominator here, the square root, the first term is insignificant, so we can let it equal zero, uh, it's a good approximation. And that simplifies this expression to an inverse relationship. The larger our input spot W1, the smaller our output spot W3 will be, and vice versa. So this is useful in its own right, but it's particularly powerful when we cascade two lenses together. So imagine the scenario shown in the bottom, where we have a small waist, expanded, and then collimated by a lens, and then that collimated beam is focused down to a waist again. And let's have that first waist, W0, be the Gaussian beam waist coming out of our laser, and that final waist, W3, be the waist necessary for our Fabry probe cavity. Now what we have is a system where when calculating the intermediate waist size and then the final waist size, we find that the ratio of waist sizes W3 to W0 is equal to the ratio of the focal length of the lenses, f2 to f1. So if we have a particular laser with known Gaussian beam radius and waist position, and we have a fabry pro cavity with a known uh, Gaussian beam shape that we're trying to match to, we can take the ratio of those waist sizes and then look for a pair of lenses in our lens kit that have a similar ratio, and that will give us a good starting point for mode matching. And what's particularly useful about this, this design and this geometry is that you can see if the space between the lenses delta z varies, it has very little effect on the output beam size. And that gives us a degree of freedom to match the constraints of our optical layout. So if we have the lens and the or the laser and the cavity one meter apart on the table, uh, but the focal lengths of the lenses require uh, you know just a few centimeters on either side of the lens, we can make up for whatever difference is necessary to physically uh, accommodate the space between the laser and the cavity just by changing delta z without having to go through and recalculate or re-optimize our, uh, our mode matching design. So this is a very useful trick to get uh, good mode matching. Of course we can always calculate the exact focal length lens and the exact positions necessary to mode match. Um, we are always subject to physical constraints whether it be the space available on the table between the laser and the cavity or the focal length available of the lenses that we have in our toolkit. So keep that in mind when you're calculating mode matching between a laser and a cavity.